Late on Sunday the 28th of October 1956, an IL-14 airliner belonging to the Egyptian Air Force's presidential flight took off from Damascus and turned west to start its flight across the Mediterranean Sea to Cairo. It was a cool, clear night, softly lit by a waning crescent moon. As the bright silver aircraft cruised on at 215 miles an hour, its passengers enjoyed some refreshments, unaware of the great danger they were now in. Fifty minutes into their journey, 120 miles south of Cyprus, streams of cannon shells suddenly slammed into the port wing, setting the engine on fire and plunging the cabin into darkness. Their attacker raced past them and then abruptly entered a spin, disappearing from view as the crew battled with their tough but now crippled aircraft. With the electrics out, the pilot couldn't signal a mayday as the attacking aircraft recovered and attacked again. Hit in the right wing and fuselage, the Ilyushin blossomed into a huge fireball and entered a terminal spin. Unknown to its dead or doomed crew and passengers, it spun down alongside its killer. The night fighter involved in this ignominious, almost slapstick action was an Armstrong Whitworth meteor. In eventually triumphing over the unarmed, unsuspecting airliner, its crew scored the type's only air-to-air kill and, I believe, the last kill scored by any type of meteor. The meteor night fighters are a relatively unheralded branch of the famous meteor family. They emerged from the unique challenge of defending the United Kingdom from jet bombers in the early part of the Cold War. This task meant dealing with a distinctly different set of problems than those encountered by the US Air Defence Command. The UK is about 40 times smaller than the US in terms of land area. Think New York State, if you're of the American persuasion. In 1950, there were 50 million people jammed into that small space. The contemporary US population was 157 million and the US economy was about three times bigger, so there was also a whole load of industry crammed into that area, not to mention a still powerful military with global aspirations. The sheer density of targets to be defended is enough to make the average strategic planner break out in a cold sweat. As the Soviet Union started to produce more and more nuclear weapons and hang them off their fast new Beagle medium bomber, the threat to the UK ramped up to a level not seen since the phony war of 1940. Those Beagles could reach any part of the UK from their bases in East Germany and do so with an hour and a half of takeoff at their 480 mile an hour top speed. There was also the possibility of 100 or more bomber raids by Tu-4 Bulls, the Soviet copy of the B-29, which had the range to attack any part of the British Isles with impunity. Realistically, the raid warning time afforded to the RAF would be in the order of 20 to 30 minutes, and the exact targets would be difficult to predict. The British weather is also an important factor, Although it's easy to target a jibe at the dreariness of the average UK day, the British climate is actually pretty mild compared to the North American or Russian equivalent. For the record, I'm recording this in late July. It is overcast and 22 Celsius, 72 Fahrenheit in old money. What the UK does have, however, is an abundance of cloud cover and, in the North Sea, a relatively high proportion of bad weather systems. Scotland and the islands have relatively short days and long nights in winter. A day fighter is less useful in this environment unless the enemy is also restricted to clement daytime weather. Also, given the distances involved, it was unlikely that an adversary would be able to field a high-performance escort fighter with the requisite range and sensors, so the additional agility of the typical day fighter was less valuable. The RAF was therefore a pioneer in all weather and night fighters. Radar-equipped Bristol bow fighters were deployed as early as September 1940, scoring their first kill on October the 25th of that year. The heavy, relatively underpowered bowfighter was not a great fighter platform, so in mid-1942, de Havilland Mosquito night fighters, equipped with both radar and an interrogator that enabled them to detect and locate German IFF signals, were introduced. These high-performance aircraft were highly effective in the remainder of the Second World War. The Mosquito seemed adequate in the years immediately after the war as well, as the Soviet strategic and tactical bomber forces consisted of mediocre and largely exhausted piston-engined aircraft. No one expected that situation to continue, however, 
and by January 1947 it was clear that a new jet-powered interceptor would be required in short order. Work on finding a suitable aircraft was, however, slow. Like their allies across the Atlantic, the RAF had a vision for a high-performance, purebred interceptor. And, like the US Air Defence Command, their aspirations were such that their interceptor program was significantly delayed. The RAF therefore required an interim aircraft to fill the gap until the middle 1950s. The logical way of creating this interim was to modify a proven type for the mission. The options at the time were the aging but storied Gloucester Meteor, the also aging single engine de Havilland Vampire, and the then proposed uprated Vampire VB 8, which would ultimately become the Venom. They could also have considered two fleet air arm airframes the Hawker Seahawk and the Supermarine Attacker. But what self-respecting Air Force officer would ever recommend a Navy plane? They quickly concluded, via an offer from Gloucester, that the Meteor was by far the most sensible option, as it was larger and more advanced in its F-8 form and had the advantage of being in mass production by several firms. The Meteor's latest F-8 version also offered decent, if uninspiring, performance, and the existing twin-seat trainer version was well regarded for its stable handling. The second seat was important, as although Britain was a pioneer in both airborne radar and computing, automation was in its infancy and a second crewman was considered essential. The next issue that the RAF faced was the capacity of Gloucester to develop and deliver a new aircraft. Fortunately, the Meteor had been designed to be constructed in a modular fashion, with a number of companies producing sections. It was therefore possible to hand the entire project off to another company in the Hawker Sidley Aircraft Group, Armstrong Whitworth. Meteor Night Fighters are therefore more correctly referred to as Armstrong Whitworth rather than Gloucester Meteors. The first prototype flew on the 31st of May 1950. It was something of a part spin special using elements of a number of Meteor variants. Although based on the T7 twin seater, it used the fuselage and tail of the F8 and the longer wings of the F-3. The cockpit was pressurised, but as with all production meteors, there were no G-suits for the crew. An extended nose contained the air intercept radar. As a consequence, the 20mm cannons were moved into the wings outboard of the engines. Power came from two Derwent 8s, each providing a modest 3,700 pounds of thrust. A ventral fuel tank and wing-mounted drop tanks completed the Armstrong Whitworth Meteor NF-11. The whole package weighed about 16,000 pounds and gave steady but unexciting performance. Top speed was 580 miles an hour at sea level and 547 miles an hour at 35,000 feet. Range was 860 miles and the maximum rate of climb was 4,800 feet per minute. The aircraft delivered what had been requested namely a two-hour patrol in all weathers with fuel capacity for 15 minutes of combat. The radar could pick up a bomber-sized target at about 10 miles and a fighter at 5. This was frankly quite poor for 1951, a fact that was known at the time. In 1953, two new versions of the Meteor Night Fighter, Marks 12 and 14, entered squadron service. These featured a further 17-inch nose extension to fit in the American APS-57 radar, called Air Intercept Mark 21 in the RAF. This unit was modified with a British strobe unit and a variable pulse function. This significantly improved detection range to up to 25 miles for bombers and 15 to 20 miles for fighter-sized targets. It also had a useful air-to-surface mode that made finding airfields at night much easier. Overall, APS-57 had more operating modes than the AI Mark 10, better definition, a limited lock follow facility and IFF and navigation beacon functions. The NF-14 was intended to carry an even more advanced radar and an even larger nose, but as the Meteor's service life was by this point very limited, the NF-14 ended up being a marginally improved NF-12, most obviously featuring an all-glass canopy for improved visibility. Both of these improved versions carried more fuel, increasing range to 950 miles. Although the single-seat Meteor suffered a very high accident rate, the two-seat Night Fighter, incorporating the aerodynamic improvements from eight previous versions, was a pliable, easy-to-fly aircraft with adequate performance. It was well-liked by its crews, who apparently referred to it as the Queen of the Skies. I guess it was stately and expensive. 
Contemporary pilots mentioned that the aircraft was light laterally but incredibly heavy fore and aft. This effect was the result of modifications made to the Meteor's control surfaces to make the aircraft less floaty on landing, a characteristic that was seen as rather unfavourable when landing on normal length runways at night. Moving the guns to the wings created a couple of additional issues. Accuracy was reduced, or rather achieving accuracy was harder versus the single seat Meteor, because with the guns so far apart, harmonisation and correct shooting range were more essential. More irritatingly, the normal belt feed system wouldn't fit in the wings, so a new flat one was designed. This had a stoppage rate of 1. I imagine that the guns jamming after just one round being fired would be a bit irritating, as would firing from one bank of guns. This is part of the story of the Israeli Meteor's seemingly amateurish attack on the Egyptian IL-14 in October 1956. The mission was an attempt to assassinate Abdel Amer, chief of the Egyptian defence staff and his close aides, as a prelude to the Suez campaign. After detecting the airliner on its radar at a range of about three miles, the fighter pulled alongside, apparently undetected. Seeing military uniforms in the windows, the Israeli pilot backed off. Executing an attack was made challenging by the Egyptian aircraft's slow speed, and, I surmise, also by the Israeli pilot's lack of experience with the type, which had only recently been delivered. The single-seat meteor stalled at around 115 miles an hour and, according to contemporary tests, did so relatively gracefully. Although I would anticipate a higher stall speed for the two-seat, it can't have been that different. The Israeli meteor NF-13 had been loaded with tracers. When the pilot opened fire, he blinded himself, leading him to jerk the stick to one side. This instinctive move, combined with the jamming of one of the cannons and resulting unbalancing of the aircraft, led to the meteor entering a spin. Upon recovering, he made another pass with the flaps extended, fired a second burst and destroyed the illusion. But the same thing happened again and he entered a flat spin from which he only pulled out 300 metres above the water. The mission was a failure in the sense that Abdel Hakim Amer was not aboard, However, because the liner went down without sending a mayday, the Egyptians didn't know it was shot down and wouldn't find out until the operation was declassified in 1989. The NF-13, incidentally, was a tropicalised NF-11 and carried additional air conditioning equipment and a radio compass. Only 40 of them were made and they mainly served in the Middle East. Six ex-RAF examples made their way to the Egyptian Air Force in the middle 1950s at the same time as another six were heading to Israel. One of these was in action on the night of the 28th of October 1956. In the RAF, Gloucester Javelins began to replace the Meteor Night Fighters from 1957. In truth, the appearance of the Bison in 1956 had made it immediately obsolete. Number 60 Squadron in Singapore was the last to give up the type, doing so in 1961. This actually marked the end of frontline meteor service in the RAF, which lasted over 15 years despite the type having been obsolete for much of that career. One question that obviously remains is, were the meteor night fighters any good? Well, I think it's worth comparing it to its closest equivalent in the USAF, the F-94 Starfire, which was based on the twin-seat P-80 Shooting Star. There were two main versions of that aircraft, the B, armed with machine guns, and the Ultimate C model, armed with two and three quarter inch rockets. The obvious point of comparison is dynamic performance. In this, the Starfire initially appears to dominate the Meteor. Although it is heavier, the afterburner gives it somewhat greater thrust to weight ratio and greater ultimate thrust. This results in a 640 mile per hour top speed versus 560 on the Meteor, 10,000 extra feet of ceiling, 51,000 versus 40,000, 60% faster climb rate, 8,000 feet per minute versus 4,800. The Meteor is theoretically more agile than the Starfire. Its wing loading is around half as high. Lack of thrust to weight ratio would, however, lead to energy loss in an extended turning fight and also impede the use of vertical manoeuvres. This may have been advantageous against a bomber in period as multiple passes may have been required to bring one down. The cost of this on-paper performance is range. Maximum range is 805 miles in the Starfire and 950 in the NF-14 Meteor. But any use of afterburner would reduce the former's range dramatically as the afterburner consumed fuel at at least twice the rate as in military power. 
it was also quite a slow afterburner to feed in, meaning that its utility in a dogfight was less dramatic than you might think. In military power, the Meteor actually dominates. The pair of Derwent 8s gives about 15% greater thrust, and the Meteor weighs about 15% less. They were also more reliable engines than the J-48 in the Starfire, and there were two of them, although they were widely spaced, which made single-engine flying tough. Better to have the option than not, I guess. The difference in performance initially looks a little bit odd. You would naturally expect that a wider-ranging but rather slower fighter would be more useful in the US context, given the size of the area to be covered. Likewise, a faster-reacting fighter seems to be more useful to the RAF, given the concentrated nature of the targets to be defended. This reflects the slightly random nature of development of early jet fighters. Genius designers did what they could to capture the speed advantages. Fit to strategy came later. In terms of weapons, the Meteor benefits from the fact that the UK had abandoned machine guns in the middle part of the war. Although they do mean the fighter has to fly into the defensive range of turret guns on Soviet bombers, armed as usual with 23mm cannons, the 20mm were fine considering they were available and well understood. The Starfire started from a platform armed with 50 caliber machine guns. These were clearly inadequate for attacking the Tu-4, which was the only bomber that could actually reach the US, and even then could only do so on a one-way trip. Moving to rockets made sense both because the US Air Defense Command saw them as a more reliable way to attack a bomber, and because the F-94 was too small to carry cannons alongside radar, autopilot and its fire control computer. In theory, the computer-controlled rocket armament was a superior option to the cannons in terms of weight of fire and accuracy. The reality was different, as described in my previous deep dive on the Starfire. I'll link to that in the show notes. The Starfire's avionics were better in some areas than the Meteor. It had autopilot and automatic fire control, neither of which were available on the Meteor. Whether these really gave value in the average interception scenario is open to debate. They were immensely ambitious systems that probably aimed too far ahead given the technology base they were started from. The Starfire's radar had more power and a little more range, but I suspect that the differences in practice were quite marginal. The contemporary pilot reports were that the AI-21 was reliable and gave good fidelity. Neither system was amazing, but on a dark and rainy night they were a game changer and a lethal advantage against day fighters. It was the early 1950s after all. Putting it all together, my conclusion is that the Meteor Night Fighter was a solid aircraft when judged against the Starfire. Which was better? Hard to call it, but given what I know about late 1940s avionics, I think I'd be inclined to trust the Meteor in a fight rather than the blaze of glory Starfire. The made-to-purpose Scorpion was significantly superior in all of its versions, but you would expect that given the cost and extended duration of its development. Fundamentally, the Meteor did the job until the Javelin arrived. Soldiering on with the Mosquito would have been crazy. Investing in an interim like the Scorpion, too expensive for the cash-strapped British Exchequer. Comparing the eventual Javelin to the contemporary Delta Dagger is an interesting subject for another video. So there we have it. The Meteor Night Fighter. A one-kill wonder. The Queen of the Skies. I hope you've enjoyed this video. I recognise that it's a bit off the beaten track. If you've got any comments, then please do leave them. I always love to hear your opinion. Thanks for watching.